how many of you have ever um, visited an art gallery or ever seen a picture that you look at a picture that it really kind of captures your attention? Anybody, everybody ever seen a picture or looked at a picture or a photo that really kind of just, just, you just stare at it, you look at it, and you go, man, this is one of the most amazing pictures, one of the most amazing uh, things I've ever seen. Well, this morning, I want us to be able to look at an amazing picture in the Bible. And it's a portrait. And it's painted by none other than Jesus himself. And that portrait is found in Luke chapter 15. So if you have your Bible, open to Luke chapter 15. If you don't have a Bible, maybe you can sit next to somebody who does. Because we're going to spend all more, we're going to spend our time this morning in Luke chapter 15. <clears throat> Excuse me, because in this passage, Jesus paints a beautiful portrait upon the canvas of Scripture. And it's a portrait about a God who cares deeply, deeply for people. And, uh, you know, this morning we sang, Oh, how he loves us. And this passage this morning from Luke chapter 15 will significantly just reinforce the reality of how much God loves us. And not only us, but people that are outside these walls, people that are perhaps, perhaps right next door this morning, uh, people that are driving up and down Custer Avenue. When God looks at them, what does he see? Well, if, if you have your Bibles, I'm going to start uh, reading in Luke chapter 15. And we're going to read through the whole chapter. So follow with me if you can, and then we'll talk about it a little bit. Okay, so starting in Luke chapter 15, verse 1, it says, Now all the tax gatherers and the sinners were coming near him to listen to him. And both the Pharisees and the scribes began to grumble, saying, This man receives sinners, and he eats with them. And he told them this parable, saying, What man among you, if he has a hundred sheep and has lost one of them, does not leave the ninety-nine in the open pasture and go after the one which is lost until he finds it? And when he has found it, he lays it on his shoulders rejoicing. And when he comes home, he calls together his friends and his neighbors, saying to them, Rejoice with me, for I have found my sheep which was lost. I tell you, in the same way, there will be more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than over ninety-nine righteous persons who need no repentance. Or what woman, if she has ten silver coins and loses one coin, does not light a lamp, and sweep the house, and search carefully until she finds it. And when she has found it, she calls together her friends and neighbors, saying, Rejoice with me, for I have found the coin which I had lost. In the same way I tell you, there is joy in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner who repents. And he said, A certain man had two sons. The younger of them said to his father, Father, Give me the share of the estate that falls to me. And he divided his wealth between them. <clears throat> Not many days later, the younger son gathered everything together and went on a journey into a distant country. And there he squandered his estate with loose living. Now when he had spent everything, a severe famine occurred in that country. He began to be in need. And he went and he attached himself to one of the citizens of that country and he sent him into the fields to feed swine. And he was longing to fill his stomach with the pods that the swines were eating, and no one was giving anything to him. But when he came to his senses, he said, How many of my father's hired men have more than enough bread? But I'm dying here with hunger. I will get up. I will go to my father. And I will say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and in your sight. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me as one of your hired men. He got up came to his father. But while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and felt compassion for him and ran and embraced him and kissed him. And the son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and in your sight. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his slaves, Quickly, bring out the best robe and put it on him. Put a ring on his hand, sandals on his feet. And bring the fatted calf, kill it, and let us eat and be merry. For this son of mine was dead and has come to life again. He was lost and has been found, and they began to be merry. Now his older son was in the field, and when he came and approached the house, he heard music and dancing. 
He summoned one of his servants and began to inquire what these things might be. And he said to him, your brother has come and your father has killed the fatted calf because he received him back safe and sound. He became angry, was not willing to go in. His father came out and began entreating him. But he answered and said to his father, look, for so many years I've been serving you and I've never neglected a command of yours. And yet you've never given me a kid that I might be merry with my friend. But when this son of yours comes, who has devoured your wealth with harlots, you killed the fatted calf for him. And he said to him, My child, you've always been with me, and all that is mine is yours. But we had to be merry and rejoice. For this brother of yours was dead, and he's begun to live. He was lost and has been found. Now may God bless to our ears. May he bless to our hearts the reading of his holy word. In Luke chapter 15, Jesus paints a beautiful portrait upon the canvas of Scripture. And it is a portrait of a God who loves, of a God who searches, of a God who finds a great joy when those that are lost are restored. The story opens up in Luke chapter 15. It says all the tax gatherers and the sinners were coming near to Jesus and listening to him. They were attracted by the person and the message of Jesus. Now, who were the tax gatherers? Well, in Jesus' day, those were people, those were Jews who collected taxes for the Roman government. Now, the Roman government was occupying Israel at that time. There was an occupying army. There was an occupying government, a foreign government set up over Israel. They were a conquered people. And there were certain individuals that were collecting taxes for this government. So it says that these tax collectors and these sinners. Now, who were the sinners? Well, those are people that were, they were Jew, Jewish by culture. But they said, ah, the synagogue, not for me. The religious holidays, festivals, not for me. These were very secular. These were very non-religious, non-practicing Jews. So the story says that these tax gatherers and these non-practicing or irreligious Jews were attracted to the person and message of Jesus. They liked being around Jesus. They liked hanging around with him. They liked associating with him, hearing his story, hearing the good news that he brought to them. But there, then there was a problem because it says the Pharisees and the Sadducees, the scribes, excuse me, began to grumble. So on one side, you have the tax collectors and you have the, the sinners or the non-practicing Jews, two groups of people. They're attracted to Jesus. On the, other, on the other side, you have the Pharisees and the scribes. These are the religious people. They know the Bible inside and out. Matter of fact, the scribes, it's told, if you would, if you, would, if you, would, uh, you know, in the, uh, in the days of uh, Jesus, they didn't have the Bible like in a book like this. It was in a scroll and they would unravel the scroll, they would unwrap the scroll, and they would read it in the synagogue, and then they, and then they would comment or they would talk about it, and then they would roll the scroll back up. And these scribes knew the Bible so well that some scholars, they say, you could take a pin, and if you put a pin into that roll, and how far it sank into the roll where it stopped, they could pro approximately tell you what book of the Bible it is and perhaps even what chapter it was. That's how well they knew the Scriptures. But they were offended at Jesus. They said, who is this guy that welcomes tax gatherers and sinners? Because they had a, they had a concept of God that was like, God would never have these people around. God is holy. He is righteous. He is just. He is totally other besides us, and he could never tolerate. He could never have in his presence people that were unclean, people that were sinners, people that were not right. And so their, their theology, their concept of God and who God is and what he's like, and then Jesus' concept of God and him associating with these type of people set up a conflict and these religious leaders say, if this guy, if this guy Jesus was really a prophet, if he really was from God, he would know who, who and what kind of person these people are. And he would certainly not associate himself with them. 
He would not hang out with them. He would not spend time with them. Why? Because God would not. God doesn't hang out with those type of people. He doesn't like those type of people. In fact, they even thought in their, in their concept of God that God enjoyed sending these people to hell. So Jesus' concept of God and who God is and the religious leaders of his day, their concept of God and who God is forms the backdrop of this story because they had a problem with Jesus. You should not be hanging out with these kind of people because these kind of people are not liked by God. And Jesus says, you guys have no idea who God is like. You have no idea what he's like. Let me tell you a story to be able to tell you and show you what God is like. And he uses a story here in Luke chapter 15 to describe who God is and what he's like. In Luke chapter 15, this is the theology of Jesus. If Jesus was going to describe to you or to me who is God and what he's like, we see it here in Luke chapter 15. And it's one story. And it's a story, it's like a diamond or it's like a precious jewel that has three different facets to it. So this story involves three different types of people. It involves a shepherd, it involves a woman, and it involves a father. But all of these people, the primary characters in this story are a searching shepherd, are a searching woman, and a searching father. Look what he says. Jesus begins in Luke chapter 15 and in verse 4. He says, And what man among you, if he has a hundred sheep and has lost one of them, does not leave the ninety-nine in the open pasture and go after the one which is lost till he finds it? Well, that's very common. Most of the people, a lot of the people that heard Jesus in his day were what? What was their occupation? Many of them were shepherds. They had sheep. Jesus says, Well, what, you guys that are shepherds, what, what man among you, if he has ninety-nine sheep and he loses one, One's lost in the wilderness. What does he do? He leaves the 99 and he goes after the one which is lost until, and he searches, he says, until he finds it. Now, I don't know about you, but for me, if I was a shepherd, I said, hey, I got 100 sheep. I got 99 that are well taken care of, accounted for. I got one that's lost kind of out there. We don't know what's happened to him. Those are pretty good statistics. I'll stay with the 99. You know, the one, too bad. You know, that's too bad. He's lost. I don't care. But I got 99 that are good. They're fat. They're getting taken care of. I can sell them at the market. I can make a good profit. Why in the world would I take my time to go after that one sheep that's kind of wandered off by himself? But Jesus says, this shepherd's different. He says, keep that 99. He says, I'm going to go after him. I'm going to look for this lost sheep. And he says, he searches until he finds it. Now, what does he do? He finally finds the sheep. In the story, the shepherd finds the sheep. Now, what does the shepherd do? Well, if it was me, you know what I'd do? Man, you stupid sheep. Get back to the flock. Kick him. Get my, get my shepherd's staff. If you have a staff, beat that sheep back to the flock. Man, you caused me time, problem. I'm out here looking around. But the text doesn't say, the story doesn't say how long the shepherd searched for him. Could have been an hour. Could have been a day. Could have been a week. We don't know. But it says the shepherd was searching for that sheep. It says the shepherd looks for the sheep and... When he finds the sheep, he beats the sheep and, he, and he, he kicks the sheep back to the shepherds, to the rest of the sheep. Is that what the Bible says? Is that what the shepherd does? What does the shepherd do? He picks up the sheep and he says, he lays the sheep on his shoulders. Whoa. He's so happy. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> He's so excited to find the sheep that he picks up the sheep and he takes the sheep back and he brings it back home. Now, he's so excited about finding the sheep. What else is, what does the text say? It says, and when he comes home, verse 6, <coughs> excuse me, he calls together his friends and his neighbors, and he says to them, rejoice with me, for I have found the sheep which was lost. Now, how many of you, when you, when you have good news, when you get excited about something, something happens in your life that it is just really, really good news, what do you want to do with that good news? You want to tell somebody. He said, man, I, I, you wouldn't believe what happened to me today. <coughs> Excuse me. You, won't, you wouldn't believe what I found or what happened to me. Everybody likes to share good news. They don't like to keep it to themselves. You, you want to talk to people. You want to share it with them. Well, this shepherd is so excited about the sheep being found, he throws a party. He calls together his friends and his neighbors, and he says, rejoice with me. Share my joy 
because I'm so excited about finding my sheep which was lost. Well, Jesus says in the same way, listen, he says, listen up, you religious leaders. He says, in the same way, there is more joy in heaven over one sinner, over one person who repents, than over 99 righteous people that need no repentance. When lost sheep are found, when lost people are found, God throws a party. There's a party in heaven. And it says heaven is rejoicing when those that are lost are found. And he says, now in case you haven't got the point of that story, he says, let me tell you, let's go on. And then he talks about a searching woman. Look what he says. Here's another story right here in verse 8. He says, or what woman, if she has ten, ten silver coins and loses one coin, does not light a lamp and sweep the house and search carefully until she finds it. So Jesus talks about a searching shepherd who went out and found his lost sheep and, and, and is a, a greatly rejoicing and throws a big party because his lost sheep was found. He says, now let me tell you something about a woman. He says, she has ten silver coins and she loses one. Now what are these coins? Well, in Jesus' day, a lot of the ladies, they would wear their bridal dowry. When they get married, they get a dowry. They would get for their bread, and they would have coins, and they would oftentimes wear these coins across their forehead to be able to show the, 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 the community, the people that they're married, that they have a husband, they have a family, they have a dowry, and it has great emotional, sentimental value to it. And it says this woman loses one of these coins. And what does she say? Uh, it's okay, I got nine coins left. It's not really that big a deal. That's not what she does. She says she lights a lamp. And she begins to sweep the house and search carefully until she finds it. Now here's a woman who says, I'm not going to give up looking. I'm not going to give up searching until I find this coin. Because this coin means a lot to me. It's part of my bridal dowry. It has a lot of great memory for me. It's important to me. So much so that I'm going to look around until I find it. I'm going to search my house. Now, most of us today... You know, if we have a house, we have carpeting on our floor. You may have hardwood floor. Okay? You know, in Jesus' day, when the when woman had the, when they had homes, you know what the homes had? They had a dirt floor, and sometimes they would bring straw, and they would put matted straw on the floor and walk around. Now, how about dropping a little coin into that, trying to find that? Can you imagine? You could see this woman sitting with, and she has a little light. She's not. She doesn't have a flashlight. Doesn't have a big electric electric light she can turn on. She has this little lamp. With, a, with an oil wick or a little candle. She's in the dark in this house and she's sifting through this straw looking for this coin that she's lost. It takes considerable time. It takes considerable effort. It takes considerable cost for her, but she's willing to do it. And it says in the story that she finds the coin. Now what does she do when she finds the coin? She throws a party just like the shepherd did. She says, it, 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 he says uh, here, and when she's found it, she calls together her friends and neighbors saying, Rejoice with me, for I have found the coin which I had lost. So this woman is so excited about finding her coin, she wants to share her joy with others. So she calls together her friends and her neighbor, and just like the shepherd, she throws a party. And she says, Rejoice with me, because I found the coin that was lost. And then Jesus says, in the same way, I tell you, verse 10, there is more joy in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner who repents. Jesus says, are you getting it? Do you understand what God is really like? God doesn't like sending people to hell. God doesn't, God doesn't rejoice with cold and sterile religious activity without any heart. God loves people that are lost. He searches for them. And he finds great joy when those that are lost are restored. So much so that heaven throws a party. Now perhaps the most poignant of all of these stories is the last one that Jesus tells. And that's the story of a searching father. The story says that a man had two sons, very wealthy man, uh, had, a, had a large estate, lots of money, lots of property, and he had two sons. 
And what does the story say? It says the younger son comes to him and says, Father, let's divide the estate and give me my share. I want the money now. I don't want to wait till after you die to inherit the inheritance. I want the money now. So the father says, okay, I'll divide the estate. I'll divide the inheritance. And uh, here's your share. And the younger son says, man, thanks, Dad. This is great. I'll see you later. And what does the story say the young son does? Does he hang around home? He says, man, I'm out of here. I'm going to Las Vegas. Okay? I'm, heading, I'm, going to, I'm going to wherever they go to be able to have a good time. So he takes his money. We don't know how much money it is, but he takes his, his estate, he takes his share of his father's inheritance, and he goes to a distant land. And what does he do with the money? Does he invest it? Does he help it to grow? Does he put it in a bank? What does he do with it? He just wastes it. What does he waste it on? He wastes it on wine, women, and song. As long as this money lasts, we're going to have a party. And I'm going to have a party. He says he wastes it on wine, women, and song. He probably has lots of friends hanging around. Hey, what are we going to do today? Because when you have lots of money, you have lots of friends. When the money runs out, sometimes the friends run out. But he's got lots of money. And as long as the money lasts, he's having a good time. He's got lots of friends. He's got lots of ladies. He's got lots of parties. He, he's the center of attention. And life is good. And all of a sudden, what happens in the story? Money runs out. Okay, Money, like everything else, isn't eternal. It's not infinite. You only have a certain amount of it. In his story, in this story, the money runs out. So he gets broke, and he says there's a severe famine that comes into this land. So that means there's not a whole lot of food, and he gets hungry. He says, man, i, I got to find something to eat. I don't have any money, don't have any food. He says, he finds a citizen of that country, and he says, hey, can I, can I get a job? Can I work for you? And the guy says, yeah, I mean, we got a job. You can go out in the field, and you can feed pigs. Now, for a young Jewish boy, young Jewish man, to be going out and feeding pigs is probably one of the worst things that could happen in life for him. Because what? For the, in the Jewish community, pigs were unclean. Pork is unclean. You don't eat it. You don't touch it. You don't go around it. And he wakes up one morning and he finds himself out in the field feeding pigs. And he's thinking, man, I'm so hungry. What does the story say? I mean, I, I, can I have some of the pig food? He's longing to eat some of the food that he's feeding the pigs. That's how hungry he is. And nobody was, was giving anything to him. And then one day, he comes to his senses. He's out there and he's feeding all this, you know, pig food. Pigs are eating. Who knows what it's like out there. Money's run out. Friends have run out. Food's run out. Everything's out. <coughs> Story says he comes to his senses. And he says, wait a minute. He says, now, how many of my father's hired men I mean, just the servants around my father's house, his estate, how many of those hired people there have more than enough food? I mean, they're, they're not starving. They at least have food. So he, he hatches an idea. He says, this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to get up, and I'm going to go back to my father, and I'm going to say, Father, when I see him, when I meet him, I'm going to say, Father, I've sinned against heaven and in your sight. Is that true? Is that true? Sure is. Boy, back in that day, you've brought shame to our family. You've disgraced us. You've taken this money, and you've left town, and you've blown all that money on wild living, and now you come back. You have the nerve to come back to me and say, but I, I, can, I, can I get back? He says, I, I, he says, I've got to go back to my father and say, Father, I sinned against heaven and in your sight. This is true. He says, I'm going to tell him I'm no longer worthy to be called your son because of my actions, because of what I did and how I behaved. I brought shame on you. I brought shame on this family. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired men. Implication being what? 
at least I'll have enough to eat. At least I'm not going to starve to death. So it says he gets up and he goes on his way. And then it says in the, in the text, as, as he's going, uh, we can look. He says, I'll get up and go to my father. And he says in verse 19, I'm no longer worthy. And it says, uh, and as he got up in verse 20 and came to his father, but while he was a still a long way off, what happened? It says his father sees him. Well, I think this is very interesting. It says while he's still a long way away, his father sees him. What is that? How about his father? I think every day, what was happening was, was, was dad was going out every day. He was looking down the road. Maybe today he'll come back. Maybe today he'll return. And one day he gets up and he's looking down the road and he sees this figure in the distance approaching. And he can tell by the gait, by the walk, how the, how the person's walking. As he gets closer, he realizes that's just not anybody on the road. That's my son. And it says the father begins to run towards the son. Now, can you imagine if you're the son on the road and you're coming and you see your dad and his servants, they start coming running down the road. What are you thinking? Oh, man, I got a world of hurt coming. I mean, my dad's going to get him. Who knows? What, what are they going to do to me? Are they going to beat me? Are they going to kill me? Are they going to turn me out and say, get away. Go, go back where you came from. You've disgraced us. <clears throat> well, it says the father comes, and what happens in the story? Well, the son begins his presentation. He says, Father, he says, I've sinned against heaven and in your sight. But he never gets to finish the second part. He says, I'm no longer worthy to be your son. He never gets to finish. Make me as one of your hard servants. Because the Father stops him. You get this in the story? You get where Jesus is going when he talks about God? What does the Father do? The Son says, I'm, Father, I've brought shame on your family. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son by my behavior. And the Father says, oh, stop. He says to his servants, he turns around to the, the servants that are coming. He says, hey, bring out the best robe and put it on him. He says, get the ring, put it on his finger, put the sandals on his feet. What was the father doing? He was doing a lot more than just dressing his son. His son wasn't naked standing there. You know, what the, you know what this story is talking about? Is the father was restoring the son back into all the rights and privileges of the family. You remember the story of Joseph in the Old Testament with the coat of many colors? That coat of many colors was a, was a coat that was worn, that, was, that communicated prestige, communicated that he belonged to a family, to a group of people. There was authority. There was care. There was comfort. There was security because of that robe or because of those clothes and what they signified. The father says, bring this robe out and put it on him. Put the signet ring on his finger back again, the family ring. Just put sandals on his feet. <clears throat> he's saying, Get it, bring him back to the family. Make He's part of the family again. And he says, let's kill a fatted calf and let's have a party. Just like the searching shepherd, just like the searching woman. He says, let's have a party because my son was lost and has been found. So they kill the fatted calf. They begin to have a great party. Do you get the story? What is Jesus teaching us here? Three times he tells the same story. It's just a little different twist. He talks about a searching shepherd. He talks about a searching woman. And he talks about a searching father. Something is lost that is of great value to the one whom it is lost from. To the shepherd it was a sheep. And that one sheep was so valuable that it warranted the shepherd leaving the 99 and going after that one sheep and searching until he finds it. When he finds it, joy floods his heart and he throws a party with his friends. Jesus says there's a woman who loses a coin that is so valuable to her that it involves diligent search. She searches until she finds it. And when she finds the coin, she says she's overcome with joy and wants to share that joy with others. And then lastly, and most significant, Jesus says he talks about a father who lost a son, who, who a son walked away and chose to walk away from his father and his family. Now, the, the story doesn't tell us how long the son was gone. 
what transpired with the Father every day in his heart. But we know this, that the Father was looking for his Son. That the Father's heart was kindled with compassion towards his Son. Because when his Son returned, his Father had every right within the culture of the day, within the laws of the day, his Father had every right to turn his Son away, to beat him, to send him out and say, I no longer have a Son. And everybody would have said, that's the right thing to do. That's a proper thing to do. No problem with that because you brought shame. That son, by his behavior, brought shame upon the father and his family. But the father's love for the son overcome the feeling of his shame. The anger, the shame, the resentment, the perhaps the love was greater. And the love was so great for his son that was lost that it, it overshadowed everything else. And it compelled the father to look and to restore his son back to the family. And Jesus says in the same way, there's great joy. Now, the, the father in the story had how many sons? Two sons. The younger son who took the money, left town, blew it all, comes back, gets restored, they have a party, and then there's an older son. And in the story, where's the older son? Did he leave town? Did he run away? No, where's the older son? Well, he's out in the field and he's working. He's working for dad. He's there, he's part of the family. He, he, you know, at the end of the day, he's tired, he's hot, he's sweaty. He's coming back from the field at the end of the day. And he's, and he's coming back and he hears this music. All this kind of gaiety. And he's like, what? And he turns to one of the servants and he says, what's going on? What's, you know, what's happening? Who's throwing the party? What does the servant say? Oh, man, you wouldn't believe it. Your brother. We thought he was dead. We didn't know where he was, what he was up to. Your brother's come back. And your father's so excited. He's throwing a big party for him. And what does the older brother do? Oh, man, that's great. Let's go join the party. I want to go give him a big hug. Tell him, welcome back. I missed you. I didn't know where you were. My heart was so concerned. I'm so happy you're back. Is that what the older son did? What's the older son's attitude? What in the world is dad doing? Wasting money on that no account, no good you fill in the blank, what he calls him. And he's so upset, he's so angry, that he refuses to go in. So I'm not going in there in that party. <coughs> I'm, not, I'm not celebrating because I'm not condoning what's going on here. I think it's the worst thing that could happen. So he stays out. So much so that what does the father have to do? The father comes out and begins to plead with him. Come on in. Come on in and join the party. The son says, look, Dad, for so many years I've been serving you night and day, sweating under the sun, sweat rolling off my brow. I've been doing all this work for you. And, man, you never bothered to, to do a party for me. Never bothered to kill a goat or a kid, kid for me and have a party. But when this younger brother of mine who, who spent all your money on wild women and song and all that, blew all that money, wasted it, you threw a party for him. I don't understand. I don't get it. And the father says, son, you don't get it. We have to rejoice. We have to be happy. Because your, son, your brother, my son, who was lost, has been found. We have to rejoice. Now, in this story, who does the older brother represent? The older brother represents those religious leaders of the day, those Pharisees, those scribes that are so hung up on their religious activity. They get so much pride from what they know about the Bible and how many times they go to religious activities. The respectful greeting in the marketplaces. And their hearts are so swelled with pride. Their heads are so big. They all evaluate other people based on whether they measure up by our spiritual standards of, of work and activity. And hardly anybody did. If any ever did. They thought they were better. They thought they were more superior. They thought they had an in with God because of all the religious activity that they did and what they knew. And Jesus says, man, you, have, you guys have no idea who God is like. You have no idea what he's like. And you can go to synagogue. You can go to church every day. You can pray every day. You can, be, you can, be, you can memorize the scriptures from cover to cover. You can be involved in all of these things. 
And that doesn't mean that doesn't mean anything if it if it leads to pride and arrogance in your heart. And if you look at other people and you look down on other people, and you begin to judge other people based upon your religious qualifications, he says, You have no idea what God's like. Because God is like a searching shepherd. He's like a searching woman. He's like a searching father that looks for the lost, searches diligently for them, and he finds great joy when they're found. Now, a number of years ago, my wife and I lived in Russia. <clears throat> we worked and ministered there, and uh, we, were, we were trying to, uh, to, to have a meeting, a, a, a training conference, in the city of Sevastopol, Russia. And this was in the late uh, 80s, early 90s. And the Soviet Union had just collapsed and things had just begun to open up. And uh, I remember we went up to a visit with the mayor and one of his assistants from the city of Sevastopol, Russia. It was a closed city. All during the, the, the Soviet time, no Westerners were allowed in the city. Nobody from the outside was allowed. Only Russians were allowed to be there. Well, now things have begun to open up. We met and met with the mayor. We said we wanted to put on a Bible training conference for local believers in the area. Could we get permission from you? Because we had to get permission from the mayor, from the leaders of the city, to be able to do that. And so we were meeting. they were meeting with him, talking in his office, and he said, hey, I, yeah, I, I don't think that should be a problem. And, uh, and uh, how many people do you want? Where do you want to do it? And so we were talking to him, and we were saying, well, we, we, we need to bring some Bibles in because a lot of the people that we were going to meet with, they didn't have any Bibles. And then the mayor turned to his assistants. He said, hey, don't, don't we have some old Bibles around here? There's a warehouse outside of town that has, like, old Bibles that were confiscated when Stalin was, was the premier. We took all the Bibles away from the Christians, and we, we just, did we burn them? Did we get rid of them? Where are they? And the sister says, yeah, they're in this warehouse outside of town. He says, well, you want some of these Bibles? You can have them. And they're just sitting out there. They've been sitting out there probably for 50 years. And we said, hey, we'll, we'll go out. We'll take a look at them. Well, so we, we went out. We had to rent a bread truck, big old bread truck that was, would sell bread. And then when they got out of bread, the trucks would be empty. We, we flagged one of these trucks down on the street and said, hey, if you pay somebody, you can come out with us to this old warehouse outside. Of town. Oh, yeah, we know where that is. And could you help us if there's Bibles or we could load some of these Bibles up for this training conference? They said, sure, you know, we pay you a couple bucks, a couple of rubles, and we, we, they would say, we'll do it for you. We'll do it with you. But we had, to, we had to hire some people. So we went on the street. We just began to hire some guys, you know, four or five guys. said, hey, if you, for, you know, give you some money, would you come out and help us load some of these Bibles? And, well, yeah, okay, you know, pay us, no problem. I mean, I didn't have any work, I didn't have anything to do. So it's some money, you bet, I'll go help you load some of these Bibles. One of these guys that we hired was named Sergey. So he gets in the bread truck. We get in the truck. We drive out to this warehouse, old dilapidated old warehouse outside of town. We open the doors, and we go into this big room, probably about twice the size of this room, and there's these big mounds with all these old tarps laying over it. And we <clears throat> said, they said, oh, these must be the Bible. So we began to unload the tarps, take the tarps off, and there were just these big stacks of old Bibles all over the place. So we started working on saying, what, what Bibles can we salvage? Which guns can we use to load on the truck to maybe for this training conference? So we started working, and after, after a while, we didn't know where Sergey was. Like, where, do he, where is he? I mean, we hired him to go up here and do this, and he's kind of disappeared. Where is he? Well, we look over at the back of the, of the warehouse, and there's Sergey sitting, sitting on the floor by this bunch of Bibles, and he, he's got this Bible in his, in his lap. We go over and like, what in the world's going on? He's weeping. And we go, like, what in the world's going on here? He says, you don't understand. He says, when you hired me on the street, he said, I was going to come with you, but my goal was I was going to try to take some of these Bibles and just sell them on the street because in those days, Bibles were like, wow, gold, because nobody had them, and to try to make a profit. So when you guys started working on these, well, I went back to this pile in the back, and he says, I threw open the tarp, and he says, this Bible on the top slid off the top and slid down me, and I grabbed it, and the, the flop sheet opened, and I looked at it, and it's my grandmother's. She was a Christian during the time of Stalin, and she was, because she was a believer, arrested by the police 
were t was taken to Siberia when he was just a small boy, and he never saw her again. She died in a labor camp because of her faith. But the flap opened, and her, in her grandmother's writing, it said, Oh, God, please save my family. And there was a list of names. And you know who the last name on the list was? It was his name. Now, what's the probability of taking somebody off the street to a warehouse, to a load of stack of, of the whole of Bibles, and the first one on the top of the stack he's at flies off, and it's his own grandmother's. That day, Sergei placed his faith in Jesus Christ and became a follower of the King of Kings. Why? Because God loves the lost, and God finds great joy when those that are lost are found. And that day, there was a party in heaven for Sergei. Just like there was a party in heaven for you, there was a party in heaven for me. When we found Jesus, and when, when Jesus actually, when God found us. And you know what? Each one of us in this room has a story to tell, don't we? So many different places, so many different backgrounds. But in, in, no matter, we could go around, we could all tell our story, we could tell what our life was like. Uh, what happened in our life and why you're here this morning. It's not an accident that you're sitting here. You just didn't wander off the street, did you? Walking by, go aloft. I don't know what this is. Let me go in here and check this place out. You're here for a reason. You're here because God touched your life. He spoke life to you. He drew you into relationship with Him, and now you have a story to tell, just like I have a story to tell. And all because God searched for you and brought people, circumstances, situations into your life in such a way that you came to faith in Jesus Christ. Because God loves you. God loves me. And he finds great joy when those that are lost are found. What time do we have to finish here? Now. Okay. I was going to use this board, but I'm not going to use it because we're out of time. But it's all about, hey, it's all about people. God is not so concerned about religious activity as he is people. When you and I leave here today, you're going to get in your car, you're going to go, and you're going to be driving by people on the street, going up and down in their cars, people in the shops next door here, people in your family, people that you live next to in your community, people that you study with, people that you see every day. But they don't know God. They don't have a relationship with God. And yet, like a searching shepherd and a searching woman and a searching father, God is looking. God is searching because of his great love, and he finds great joy when those that are lost are found. And he finds those that are lost through us, through you and me, who are like what? Searching shepherds, searching women, and searching fathers and mothers and brothers and sisters who have the privilege of being able to go to those that are lost and to tell them about a God who loves them and a God who desires to have a relationship with them. And that's why we celebrate communion. You know, here at Loft, you guys have you celebrate the Lord's table. It's an opportunity to remember the sacrifice of Jesus Christ and what he's done for us through the bread and the cup. It's also an opportunity for us to look forward, to look ahead to the sure and certain return of Jesus Christ when he comes in great glory to take us home to be with him forever. Now between now, between that time, between this day and that time, how many people can God can use us to be able to give the good news and to help bring into the kingdom of God? Because that's the only reason we're here. That's the reason God leaves us here so that we can share the good news of Jesus with those that need to hear to help those that are lost to be found.